Welcome to today's RNA Collaborative Talks. Today's talks are hosted by the National Cancer Institute RNA Biology Initiative at the National Cancer Institute, National Institutes of Health in Bethesda and Frederick, Maryland. I'm Sandra Wallen, and I will be today's monitor. Before we begin, I've been asked by the RNA Society to encourage all of you to apply for RNA Society awards and reminding you that the deadline to submit nominations is October 2nd. So um, I've also been asked to remind you that the seminar is recorded and to please write your questions in the Q&A rather than the chat and we'll ask them following each talk. So today's speakers are both from the Center for Cancer Research at the National Cancer Institute. Our first speaker is Pedro Batista. Pedro is a Stadman investigator, which is similar to an assistant professor at a university. Pedro is a member of the Laboratory of Cell Biology within the Center for Cancer Research at the National Cancer Institute. And he's gonna talk about rewiring of RNA methylation by oncometabolites in kidney cancer. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope everyone can see my slides. Um, I would like to start by thanking the RNA Collaborative Seminar and the RNA Initiative at the NCI to, in, to give me the opportunity to speak to such a broad uh, audience. And today I'll tell you about the efforts in my lab to sort of understand how RNA methylation is impacted uh, by changes in metabolism, specifically using kidney cancer. I'm sorry, I don't think we can see your slides. Could you please share screen? Uh, oh, can you see them now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, sorry, sorry about that. Um, so in the cell, RNA molecules uh, will interact with other factors in the cell, such as RNA binding proteins or non-coding RNAs. And these interactions will uh, have an effect on the, either the maturation or the functional outcome of uh, some molecules. For example, in the case of mRNAs interacting with RNA binding proteins or microRNAs, will uh, determine how much, when, and where a protein is made. In my lab, we're interested in a layer of information that sort of acts in between the cis, the mRNA, or an RNA transcript, and all the trans factors that are available in, in the cell, and that is the, the RNA modifications. So a presence of an RNA modification in an RNA transcript can create a, doc, a new site for an RNA binding protein to bind, or it, it can do the opposite. And once a sequence is methylated, an RNA binding protein does not, no longer binds there. Because of the effect of RNA modifications on RNA structure, um, RNA modifications can also impact the ability of RNA binding proteins that don't necessarily directly read the modification, but require specific RNA structure, structures to interact with the RNAs. And then, of course, the binding of these proteins will impact whether the RNA gets degraded or gets translated or where in the cell the RNA localizes. So the presence of the modification itself on the RNA then can be the, the outcome in, for some modifications of the balance between the activity of enzymes that put the modification on the RNA or enzymes that can remove or modify this modification. And this is what we're interested in, in understanding in my lab is how these sort of two opposing activities can be influenced by the metabolic environment of the cell. And the reason why we think that the two are connected is that these enzymes often use small molecules as cofactors that are part of the metabolic pathway. So for example, a lot of the, the enzymes that remove methyl groups from RNA are belong to the alpha ketoglutarate dependent deoxygenase family. And these are enzymes that require alpha ketoglutarate, ketoglutarate oxygen, and iron to, uh, for their enzymatic activity. And 
what one of the things that we've learned from the efforts to understand the cancer genome is that in some types of cancer, some of the most prevalent mutations, and we do think that some of these mutations might play an important role in driving the disease, are mutations in metabolic enzymes. And so these mutations in metabolic enzymes will result in the accumulation of a very high level of metabolites that are thought to play a role by inhibiting uh, and the activity of enzymes. So in this case, for example, the accumulation of 2-hydroxyglutarate or fumarate or succinate are, are thought to, in, to, in, um, to inhibit the function of these enzymes since they are very similar to, to the alpha-ketoglurate, which is the cofactor, but they're not the, the right cofactor for enzyme activity. So in this family of enzymes that we know sort of responds to the accumulation of oncometabolites uh, in cancer, there are five enzymes that have been described to remove or modify um, methylation in RNAs. And these are uh, listed here at the center. And at the right side, I I've put the, um, the different types of methylations that each enzyme has been shown to, to target. So you can see that the there is a lot of different type of RNA modifications that, that are potentially regulated by enzymes in this family. On the left side, I've listed the metabolites that have been shown to impact the activity of this family of enzymes, and they are connected um, with, with lines sort of representing the affinity between these metabolites and the enzymes. And you can appreciate from here that different enzymes have different affinities for to this metabolite. So you one would predict that accumulation of a certain metabolite would impact one enzyme more than the other, and this would translate in the effect on different RNA modifications also being different. And lastly, we also know that these enzymes don't all localize to the same place in the cell, and we have, uh, for example, ALK-BH7 seems to exclusively localize to the mitochondria, while ALK-BH5 and FTO can either be in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm. So in my lab, we're trying to understand all of these, all of these different factors come together to regulate gene expression in the event of metabolic rewiring, which we know is a hallmark of cancer. So as a model, we are using an hereditary form of kidney cancer. Uh, this, is, this is a cancer that that develops in patients that have a germline mutation in the fumarate hydrogenase enzyme, and throughout their, the, the patient's life, in some tissues, there is a loss of the functional copy of FH, which leads to a complete loss of FH activity, which in the case of the kidney leads to the development of very, very aggressive, uh, of a very aggressive type of tumor that metastasizes very, very early. So we're working in collaboration with the Linenhan Lab here at the National Cancer Institute. We, uh, we have gotten some cell lines derived from patients that have these mutations, and we are using these as a model to understand how metabolic rewiring can impact uh, RNA modifications. So we start with a, with a parental cell, and then in order to understand what is the impact of a given metabolite accumulating at very high levels, we either using a lentivirus deliver a functional copy of the gene, so I often call those the wild type cells, or a, a mutated form. And so we and we did this because we wanted to sort of minimize the effect of uh, delivering a transgene with lentivirus. So we are controlling, uh, are using these cells as a control. So we we try to make sure that in both cells, in the cells that we're comparing, the transgene is expressed at similar levels, as you can see here by Western blot. Uh, and you can see in this colometric assay that measures activity of FH in the gel that delivery of the wild type copy does restore FH activity. And we're using MDH activity as a control. Um, Delivering a functional copy of FH does result in a drop in the levels of fumarates. There's about a 50-fold difference. And we also observe an increase in the levels of alpha-ketoglutarate. Um, this is um, important because as um, it has been sort of shown and suggested that the, the activity of these enzymes will depend on the sort of the ratio between the cofactor, in this case, alpha-ketoglutarate and the potential inhibitors. 
And the ratio that we see in the cells where we restore that phage activity is about in line with other cell lines that of kidney origin that we have worked with in the lab. Now, uh, these cells restoring fumarate activity uh, has uh, several impacts on cell. I'm not gonna go over everything, but we essentially build a isogenic model where that behaves uh, as others in the literature have demonstrated for when you restore uh, enzymatic activity. One thing that I do uh, like to highlight and how these cells behave and has been shown previously by other groups and we also see in the cell lines that we've built is that the invasion phenotype of these cells is uh, dependent on the accumulation of fumarate. So you can see that both the parental cell line or the cell line over expressing the mutated copy of FH uh, are able to invade on the matrigel assay, but once we restore fumarate activity, the cells are no longer able to do it or are a lot less efficient doing it. Um, so with this model for uh, to study sort of metabolic rewiring, and in this case, the accumulation of very high levels of fumarate, we started to look at the transcriptome of the cells. So when we look at steady state mRNA levels, uh, delivery of the, the mutant copy really had very minimal impacts on uh, gene expression. Uh, the only significant difference we observed was uh, the overexpression of the transgene. But delivery of the wild type copy of fumarate hydrotase did lead to uh, significant changes in gene expression uh, in the steady state level of mRNAs. So we then used a mass spec to measure the level of several types of methylation on mRNAs. And while for most, mo most type of methylations, and on the left, you can see M7G as an example, we did not see uh, significant changes on the mRNAs. We did see a significant uh, increase in the methylation of RNAs in cells that accumulate high levels of fumarate, which we predict would inhibit the function of enzymes that are capable of removing this modification. This is about a, I think about a 10% difference, which is in line with what has been previously shown in studies where these uh, enzymes are uh, knocked, out, knocked out. Now, we, because we did see that there was changes in gene expression, we also wanted to make sure that the changes we see for the global levels of M6A are not a consequence of, for example, having more or less of the writers of the erasers. Um, we looked uh, by Western blot, we looked at our RNA sequencing data. Um, and so far we have not uh, been able to see any significant differences in the global levels of these uh, enzymes. The, the two of the enzymes that are known to remove, to be capable of, capable of removing M6A from transcripts have also been shown that their activity in substrates can be linked to how they localize in the cell. Um, but here again, we also do not think that accumulation of fumarate leads to any significant changes. So we see that FTO is almost exclusively nuclear in our cells, regardless of the, the level of fumarate that accumulates. And alpH5, we see it accumulating both in the cytoplasm and the nucleus. But again, we don't see any significant changes uh, between the two cell types. So we do think that the changes that we are seeing in the, level, the global levels of M6A are related to the accumulation of fumarate, which has an inhibitor role for enzymes such as FTO and alpH5. So having seen a, an effect uh, on, at the global level of M6A on the RNAs, we then wanted to ask what are the RNAs uh, that have where there's a potential hypermethylation? Uh, so to study this question, we use M6A IP and sequencing. So very briefly, we start with a poly-A fraction of the RNA. Um, the RNA is then fragmented and we use an antibody that is that specific for M6A, although we do know that there are some other modifications and I will briefly mention that later that can be captured by this RNA. And then we uh, sequence both the input and the immunoprecipitated fraction. And we can use this to identify sites that have at least one RNA modification. Uh, in general, we see that both cell lines have this, the sort of by now well-established landscape for M6A modification. 
with a large majority of sites being close to the beginning of the tree prime intervale. We also see a, a considerable enrichment at the five prime end. Here, it could be, there could be presence of M6A, but there is also a modification, a, a more complex modification, M6AM, that the, most antibodies uh, cannot distinguish. And so some of the, the signal that we get here could be M6AM instead of M6A. So we use the differential um, expression analysis to identify where on the RNAs uh, is do we see the increased levels of uh, methylation. Um, so in both cell lines, we had about 15,000 of these regions. In, in about 1,100 of these regions, we see an increase of a signal in our RNA sequencing experiments. These about 1,100 sites cover about 950 transcripts. Of these, about 137, so about 10% of the transcripts uh, or of the sites where we see uh, an upregulation of the M6A signal uh, occur in the very first 100 nucleotides of the transcript. And so here, uh, we cannot really distinguish between M6A and M6AM, both of which uh, have been uh, previously shown to be substrates for the FTO uh, enzyme. So just to give you an idea of how the data looks like, this is, um, this is a browser shot. You can see two genes here as an example. Um, these are genes that in the literature have been shown to be targets of either uh, ALK-BH5 or FTO. Um, and because there are, because there are sometimes issues of specificity with the antibodies, we've also started to try to validate some of these um, uh, regions by uh, antibodies independent methods. So we're using uh, uh, an approach that first was published by Castellanos Rubio and colleagues where we use an enzyme that is uh, sensitive, an RT enzyme that is sensitive to the presence of M6A. And so we can compare the activity of this enzyme and superscript tree, which will it is processive and will not be interrupted by the presence of M6A within sites that are where the cDNA could be blocked by the modification or not. And we, what we see in the cases we've tested so far is that there is a, a, a lot less cDNA generated in the mutant cells than in the wild type cells, again, suggesting that there is a modification present that is blocking the synthesis of cDNA. So what are, this, what are the transcripts that seem to be uh, overly modified? Um, we have, we have found among the genes that have sites where that we think are hypermethylated, genes like Vimentin, which is an important regulator of the EMT process, which has been previously shown to drive some of the phenotypes of these cells. And we also see an enrichment for GoTerm groups that are related to cell adhesion and cell um, movement which we do think is in line with the phenotype of these cells that we know is fumarate dependent. And we're currently trying to determine exactly how loss of function of this uh, demethylase is such alk BH5 and FTO might impact the activity of the, the cellular phenotype of being very aggressive uh, invader cells. I, I did tell you in the beginning that there are more modifications that can be targets of this family of enzymes. And so we did want to start to take a more broad look at how the, all the parts of the cellular transcriptome are affected. Uh, and we're particularly interested in what happens in the mitochondria. The reason being that the mitochondria is expected to be the site in the cell where the fumarate accumulation is highest. So one modification that we've looked at so far is uh, M1A. There is an M1A site in the mitochondrial transcript encoding for the ND5. And so here we used uh, an assay that was first described in, in this paper by Safra and colleagues, where you take advantage of the ability of some enzymes to misincorporate during the cDNA synthesis when they go through some uh, modified nucleotides. So here on the left is sort of our control. We looked at the 28S 
at a site in the 20S uh, ribosomal RNA, which is a site we know it's M1 modified, at very high stoichiometry, and we did we see indeed a very high level of misincorporation over this site. And D5, we do see misincorporation. It's at a much lower level, but here we don't we don't believe that there are significant differences between the levels of uh, M1A on the ND5 transcript between the cells that accumulate fumarate and the cells that have sort of a normal fumarate accumulation. But we didn't necessarily expect a difference here because we also don't know that this site is the target of any of the demethylases. But we do know that there are, again, in the mitochondria, tRNAs that have, for example, the M1A modification that it responds to the levels of BH1. So I'm showing you here two examples from, the, from this study by Kawarada and colleagues, where they've shown that after knocking out BH1, you see an increase in the termination on a primer extension assay. So in this assay, you have a primer, and then you, you will generate cDNA. But you're using an enzyme that when it sees an M1A, it will drop out. Um, and then the reaction ends when there is a missing nucleotide. So you can see here the two products. Um, in our cells, we don't see, although we initially expected, uh, since AlphaBH1 is in the mitochondria, we, we had some, our hypothesis was that there would be some differences, but comparing the cells where FH activity is restored and the cells that are expressing a mutated form of FH and therefore don't, don't um, accumulate high levels of fumarate, we have not uh, observed any significant differences. Um, this is not what we uh, initially hypothesized, but it does raise the interesting possibility that ALPH1 might be particularly specific about cofactors. Uh, and this is something that we're exploring further um, as we move forward. So just to try to sort of summarize what, uh, what I've told you about today, we are interested in, this, uh, in enzymes and this family of enzymes that can respond and sort of translate what happens metabolically in the cells to, into gene expression. Uh, and our observations suggest that different types of modifications on different classes of RNAs are gonna be uh, responding differently to this type of uh, events that happen, such as metabolic rewiring uh, when cancer um, develops. So I'll end with my most important slide, which is the acknowledgement. This work has um, relied on the help of a lot of people. The project has been led by uh, my phenomenal postdoc, Christina Fitzsimmons, and with the help of people from both our lab and uh, across the NIH. Um, and we are, if you are, if you find these type of questions interesting, come and join us. We are looking to, to add to our team. And I will be happy to take questions. So please write your questions in the Q&A. So I have a question, Pedro. Yes. Can you speculate on which modifications will be affected? What kinds of RNAs? Um, so looking so looking back at these sort of in vitro studies um, that have tried to measure the affinity between some of these enzymes and the potential oncometabolites, um, I would say that M6A on mRNAs and then M1A on tRNAs are are two strong candidates. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, but there is also, for example, ALKVH7, which has been recently described, and this ALKVH7 again localizes exclusively to the mitochondria and is responsible for an M22G modification on the mitochondrial transcript that is processed to generate the mRNAs and the tRNAs. Um, and again, because it is in the mitochondria, it's, uh, it's, it's of particular interest. It would be interesting to measure what's happening because uh, mitochondria dysfunction is also a hallmark of this type of cancer, so. So we have a question from Julia Guducci. She says, hello, Pedro, thanks for your interesting talk. Did you check if in the cells transduced with the mutant genes, there's DNA damage? <laughs> 
we have not checked for DNA damage um, on these cells. Um, I think there, there are some interactions between the loss of fumarate and a lot of the DNA damage repairs, but we have not compared to, we have not checked on that, no. We have a question from Ki Hong Jang. Thanks for your great talk. Do you think several methylations have synergif, synerg, synergic effects on the determination of mRNA fates? So th this is, I think, a very interesting question and not something that I think we're starting to see more studies now. I mean, it is fairly challenging to map some of these modifications. So map two different modifications on the same transcript, I think it's something that we are starting to be able to do now. And so I think this is a very interesting and important question. This is actually what my postdoc is interested in doing going forward as she will grow up and be um, an independent scientist. But I, I think so. And I think there's a couple of studies that suggest that that is the case, but we definitely need a lot more work on that. So we have some questions from Charles Boo Nader. Uh, the first one is you mentioned that fumarate might be inhibiting FTO. Is it a competitive or allosteric inhibitor? Uh, I believe it's competitive, but I would have to double check. Okay. And he also asked if methylation of proteins is impacted by fumarate accumulation. Um, yes, and not just methylation. So, uh, for example, the HIF transcription factor there's an hydroxylation reaction and the enzymes responsible for that modification have been shown to be inhibited by accumulation of fumarate. There is also the fact that fumarate itself can attack some, uh, some types of amino acids. I'm blanking on the amino acid, but, um, and that's, itself, that's another PTM that it's specifically to, I, uh, to, uh, to, to context of high accumulation of fumarate. Um, so there is definitely a lot more happening and we're sort of trying to understand how the transcriptome is impacted, but you can say that a high accumulation of fumarate impacts many other things. And we have a question from Hadi Najafi asking if there's any mitochondrial specific RNA modifications. I, I cannot think of one that is specifically to the mitochondria. There are definitely modifications that play very important roles in the mitochondria, like the methylation that is important for the maturation of the mitochondrial transcripts or the 5FC modification on the methionine and the mitochondrial methionine tRNA. I don't know that those don't exist elsewhere in the cell. So that would be sort of a a statement that would eventually, we'll probably eventually find those modifications elsewhere, but there is definitely modifications that play very important roles in the mitochondria. So thank you. Let's move on to our next speaker. So our second speaker is Joanna Vidigal, who is a Stadman investigator in the Laboratory of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology and a member of the NIH Distinguished Scholar Program. She's part of the Center for Cancer and Cancer Research at the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda. And she's going to talk about AGO2 Unchained. All right. Can everyone see my slides? Looks great. Okay. Thank you, Sandy, for the introduction and for the opportunity to present my work here today. What I would really like to tell you everyone about today is our efforts in the lab to try to understand how the functions of Argonaut 2 are regulated in vivo. I think we're relatively familiar with the micronate pathway, and so for the sake of time, I won't go into any major details, except to remind you all that Argonaut proteins play central roles in this context. Now, in mammals, uh, we have four Argonaut proteins from the ego plates, and we call them Argonaut 1 to 4. And all of them can bind to mature microRNAs in the cytoplasm. And then these small RNAs direct the proteins to target transcripts through short sequence complementarity. We also know that for repression to occur in this pathway, 
We need argonaut proteins to associate with TNRC6, also known as GW182 in flies. And this is a binding partner that serves as a docking platform for the effect effector pro proteins of the complex, which ultimately lead to translational repression as well as mRNA, mRNA degradation. We've known about this pathway for 30 years now, and since then we have learned a lot about the molecular details of the pathway. And we've also learned that it plays essential roles in animal physiology and human disease. What's been really fascinating to me is the studies that have shown that not only this pathway plays essential regulatory roles, but that the pathway itself is under regulation at virtually every step. And yet I would argue that we have very little understanding under which physiological context the regulation of the pathway is important and what physiological functions that serves. And I think that the major obstacle to be able to address those questions has been the lack of antibodies that detect proteins from the pathway with a high degree of specificity in vivo. And so to address that question, we decided to generate a new mouse model in the lab where we tagged our favorite protein with a small tag in its endogenous locus and generated an AJ Ego2 mouse model. And this has been work led uh, by Laura Sala, a postdoc in the lab. Now, with this mouse, we can not, not only study the functions of Argonaut, Argonaut 2 with very well characterized antibodies, but as importantly, we can use wild type litter mates as controls for our experiments. I'm not going to go over all the data, but suffice it to say that we have done extensive characterizations of these animals, and we found that Argonaut 2 functions remain intact. And in fact, homozygous animals for this tag are born at the expected Mendelian ratios. And as far as we can tell, they are morphologically and histologically in indistinguishable from littermate controls. And so we believe that we are in a good position to start to address how Argonaut protein is regulated in vivo. We decided to start addressing this question in the context of mouse splenocytes. One reason being that these cells are very easy to isolate as single cells, which gives us a lot of flexibility in the experiments that we can make. But in addition, uh, the lab of Greg Thompson have previously shown that when they do fra complex fractionation assays in virtually any cell line that they have in the lab, they always saw Argonaut 2 eluding in high molecular weight fractions corresponding to Argonaut 2 bound to a target RNA and the whole risk complex that's necessary for microRNA mediated gene repression. What's surprising to me is that when they do exactly the same assays in the context of primary splenocytes, then they consistently see Argonaut eluding as a low molecular weight protein, indicating that it's not stably bound to any sizable protein. And this suggested to us that in the context of these primary splenocytes, Argonaut 2 is under some type of regulation that's quite different from the context in which we typically study this protein, which is immortalized cell lines. And we decided to use our mouse model to try and figure out what's going on here by confirming one by one that the details that we know are true for this pathway in the context of cell lines remain true in the context of these primary cells. We started to assays by doing an immunofluorescence to the AJ tag, followed by super resolution microscopy. And we also stain in these cells, these cells with DAPI, which we use as a proxy for the nuclear compartment, as well as tubulin, which we use as a proxy for the cytoplasmic compartment. And you can see that in these plinocytes, the cytoplasm is really, really tiny. Now, our expectation when we did these assays was then we look was that when we would look at the AJ signal in cells from our tagged mice, the whole signal would look very similar to the staining that we see for tubulin, indicating that the majority of Argonaut 2 is confined to the cytoplasm. But instead, what we consistently see is that the majority of the AJ signal is localized to the nucleus. And I hope that you can appreciate that the antibody that we're using for this immun immunofluorescence is quite specific, as we have little to no signal in our wild type controls. Now, of course, we didn't do this in one, but in many, many cells. And so over many confocal images, we can quantify and estimate how much argonaut is actually in the nucleus of these cells. And we estimate that's roughly 90% of the pool. Uh, and this fits very well with subcellar fractionation assays that we have done in both B and T cells, showing again the majority of the signal in the nucleus, and again using wild type animals as control. Now, one thing about 
data that I have just shown you is that it comes from cells that we isolate as quiescent cells. And this means that they have temporarily exited, exited the cell cycle. And this is obviously very different from the context in which we typically study Argonaut 2, which is in cell lines that are constantly proliferating. And because of this, we wondered whether if we forced these splenocytes out of quiescence and into the cell cycle, whether this would also lead to a change in Argonaut 2's localization. Now, the aspect of working with splenocytes is that we can actually do that experiment by activating the cells ex vivo through exposure to different cytokines. And when we do that, within two days, the cells increase in size and start proliferating. But more importantly to us, this happens concomitantly with a significant shift in the localization of Argonaut uh, localization, which is now mainly in the cytoplasm and looks very, indeed very similar to the tubulin staining. Again, we did this over many, many cells. And so we estimate that while in resting or quiescent B and T cells, only 10% of the total Argonaut 2 is in the cytoplasm, this fraction increases significantly within two days of activation to about 40%. And again, this fits well with subcellular fractionation assays done in both cell types. Now, this data, together with starvation experiments in mouse embryonic fibroblasts that I don't have time to show you, says that nuclear accumulation uh, of AGO2 is not restricted to just simply splenocyte biology, but we think that it's instead a characteristic of quiescent cells. In fact, we now believe that nuclear localization of AGO2 is under the regulation of the PI3 kinase AKT mTOR pathway, because if we inhibit this pathway, with chemicals at any of its nodes in immortalized fibroblasts from our mouse, um, we see a significant increase in the nuclear localization of AGO2. In contrast, if we um, inhibit the MEK pathway, another mitogenic pathway that's highly active in immortalized MEPs, uh, this has no effect in AGO2 localization. Now, we think that regulation of AGO2 localization by the PI3 kinase mTOR pathway is pretty significant because this is one of the best established regulators of cell cycle entry and exit. In fact, we know that we have very high levels of PI3 kinase signaling in proliferating cells and that you need low levels of this pathway to enter quiescence or maintain the quiescent cell state. So one of the ways that we know that the PI3 kinase mTOR pathway regulates exit from quiescence is by promoting the translation of many proteins. And what was curious to us was that amongst its translational targets are essential components of the mic, such as Trosha, Xpartin 5, and TNRC6, all of which are expressed at very low levels in quiescent or resting splenocytes and whose protein levels increase significantly when the cells are induced to proliferate. And this is in contrast with AGO2, whose levels we are probing here with the AJ tag, uh, which does not really change in between the two conditions. Now, we are particularly curious with the fact that TNRC6 has very low levels in quiescent cells, because as I've told you in the beginning, this is an essential cytoplasmic binding partner of Argonaut2 within the microRNA pathway. And its low abundance in quiescent cells fits very well with complex fractionation assays showing that AGO2 eludes as a low molecular fraction in these cells. And so this led us to wonder if low levels of this protein in quiescent cells contributed to some extent to AGO2's nuclear localization. We knocked down TNRC6 again in our immortalized fibroblasts, and indeed we see a significant and dose-dependent accumulation of argon 2 in the nucleus, where we have a modest increase of, of nuclear signal when each TNRC6 family member is silenced independently, and the more significant one when all the family members are silenced together. And this is very similar to the data that Gunther Meister has shown in human cells. Based on this data, we propose a model where in proliferating cells, where we have very high levels of PI3 kinase, AKT, mTOR signaling, TNRC6 is efficiently translated, and this promotes the retention of AGO2 in the cytoplasm, where it acti actively represses genes through the microRNA pathway. In contrast, in quiescent cells, where PI3 kinase signaling is slow, we have inefficient translation of TNRC6, which 
enables ego 2 to travel to the nucleus through a mechanism that we don't really understand. Now, because in quiescence, many of the components of the microarray pathway are very poorly expressed, and Argonaut 2 is not even in the cytoplasm, or at least the majority of it, we would argue that the majority of Argonaut 2 is likely not engaged in microRNA mediated gene repression in this context. And so the question that that raises, of course, is what is it doing in the nucleus of these cells? We decided to repeat our subcellular fractionations, but this time dividing the nuclear fraction to nuclear soluble and nuclear chromatin enriched fractions. Uh, to our surprise, when we do these assays, we find that about half of the AJ signal is recovered in the chromatin enriched fraction. We also repeated the fractionation, but this time including, including an RNA treatment step just before we um, separate the two different nuclear fractions. And our reasoning was that if association of argonaut to chromatin is RNA dependent, then treatment with the RNases should lead to a decrease in the chromatin fraction signal. And indeed, this is what we see. So we believe that in quiescence, argonaut 2 accumulates in the nucleus where it binds to chromatin through RNA. This data also encourages us to perform cheap seq experiments to try and identify the low site to which nuclear argonaut 2 binds to. Uh, and to our surprise, when we analyzed it, this data, we find that argonaut 2 is specifically enriched at young mobile transposons. As an example, I'm showing you here the signal density plots for a chip performed with the AJ antibody on cells that are either homozygous for the tag or wild type for the tag. For all copies um, of two young line elements or all copies of two ERV repeats. And as I hope you can appreciate, this shows a significant and specific enrichment for ego 2 over these elements. Reassuringly, we see this enrichment not only when we look at all reads, but also when we look at reads that map uniquely uh, to the T at the borders of the T's, or when we do the analysis over the consensus sequence of the T, uh, which I will not show you today. To test if AGO2 has any regulatory function of this loci, we decided to use um, mice that have two flux alleles for argonaut 2 and also express a pre-RT2 from the ROSA26 locus. And what this means is that if we treat these cells with tamoxifen, then pre-RT2 goes to the nucleus and recombines the two flux alleles, generating a conditional null uh, cell line, uh, cell. As controls, we use animals that still express CRE-RT2 from the ROSA26 locus, our wild type for ego 2 And this allows us to control not only for tamoxifen treatment, but also for the expression of CRE. And we were happy to see that in cells in which we conditionally delete Argonaut 2 we also see a concomitant upregulation of young line elements, uh, consistent with the notion that Argonaut 2 has repressive functions over these transcripts. I've told you in the beginning that we see argonaut eluding as a low molecular weight protein. And so we don't think that repression in this context requires necessary proteins to perform, uh, to, to repress the expression of transposons. And this would be quite different from the requirement of a large complex to repress genes through the microRNA pathway. Instead, we hypothesize that perhaps argonaut 2, in the absence of binding partners, could be repressing transposons through its conserved catalytic domain. In favor of this hypothesis is the fact that we know that mammalian argonaut 2, at least in vitro, does not require any accessory factors to be able to cleave targets. And the only thing that it really requires is the existence of perfect or near perfect complementarity between the bound small RNA and its targets. And not only that, we know that argonaut proteins from the ego play Ego plate actually regulate repetitive sequences through cleavage in many other organisms like Drosophila or yeast. And yet, we also know that in vertebrates, there are many obstacles to efficient RNAi. And as a consequence of those, um, this repressive function of transposon sequences through cleavage by argonaut seems to be largely absent in vertebrates and in mice with the notable exception of mouse oocytes. <laughs> 
Nevertheless, when we do small RNA sequencing in quiescent cells, we do see small RNAs of the sizes that could potentially bind to Ardenaut2 that map with perfect complementarity through transposon sequences. And they do so both against, um, and they map both to the sense and antisense sequence of transposons with a slight bias towards antisense RNAs. And we also see that these uh, small RNAs are the most abundant for autonomous retrotransposons, which are ERVs and lines for which we also see enrichment for AGO2 in our chip. And so the presence of these small RNAs with perfect complementarity to transposon sequences and the fact that in quiescence, AGO2 does not seem to have stable binding partners led us to wonder whether uh, quiescence represented an example of a somatic context in which repression of transposons by argonaut 2 requires its catalytic domain. And so we repeated the same experiment as before, but this time we have a mouse that has only one flux allele and where the second allele carries an argonaut mutant that has a point mutation in its catalytic domain, and so it's unable to cleave targets. As controls, we have a mouse that still has a single flux allele, but where the second allele is wild type, or an animal that's wild type in both alleles for Argonaut 2. In all cases, we still have Creati 2 expressed from the Rosa 26 locus, which again means that if we treat the cells with tamoxifen, if you have a flux allele, this allele gets recombined. And so in one case, you end up with cells that express only a catalytic mutant for Argonaut 2 or only a wild type allele for Argonaut 2. And we were very excited to see that as in the previous experiment, we do see upregulation of transposon sequences in our mutants. Specifically, we see upregulation of line elements, single allele is lost, and this suggests to us uh, haply sufficiency for AGO2 in transposon repression. But more importantly, we observe the highest upregulation uh, in our catalytic mutant against both of the controls, suggesting that an intact catalytic domain is required for this function. To conclude, we think that in contrast to proliferating cells, where argonaut 2 accumulates in the cytoplasm associates with the risk complex to regulate mRNAs uh, post-transcriptionally, in quiescent cells, argonaut 2 travels and accumulates in the nucleus where it regulates transposons co-transcriptionally, a function that requires its catalytic activity. This is, of course, rather reminiscent of the role that peewee proteins uh, play in the germline, where they preserve the genome against the effect of mobile elements. And we think that the same may be true for nuclear argonaut in quiescent cells. In fact, we see a striking negative correlation between AGO2 enrichment in our chip and the evolutionary age of the element with the highest enrichment over the youngest uh, repeats. And these are the repeats that are still mobile, meaning that their expression, if not controlled, can lead to them jumping to other genomic locations and potentially disrupt those loci. And now, while that's not great in any type of cell, I would argue that it's particularly problematic in the context of quiescent cells. One reason being that these are very, very long-lived cells. They can stay in our bodies in the state of quiescence for months up to years. And this means that an unrepressed element has increased chances of dis disrupting a pretty deleterious locus. But in addition to that, and unlike every other cell in adult bodies, quiescent cells retain the ability to re-enter the cell cycle. And they do so in response to injury or stress this is essential to maintain tissue homeostasis. But you can imagine that mutations that disrupt this function can have catastrophic consequences not only to the quiescent cell itself, but the tissue it resides in and ultimately the organism. And so with that, I would just like to uh, acknowledge work. As I said in the beginning, this has been led by a postdoc in my lab, Laura Sala, with the help of an undergraduate student, Srivide Chandra Zikar. And we've had help from many collaborators, but I would like to give a particular shout out to Michael, who helped us with the confocal and super resolution images, with Pedro and his lab, who helped us with the ChipSeq experiment, and Todd McFarlane and 
uh, Rachel Cosby, which are actual TE experts and helped us with the TE analysis. And thank you all for your attention. Thanks, Joanna. We already have a bunch of questions in the chat. So the first one is, do you think that AGO2 protein translocation to the cytoplasm is also controlled by kinase pathway? Well, I, at least based on our experiments, what we think is clearly, I, I think you do need the PI3 kinase activity, right? Because if you have an active PI3 kinase signaling, we know that this promotes the translation of TNRC6, and we've know, we know that the abundance of TNRC6 plays a role. What we also know, but we haven't tested in the lab, is that the PI3 kinase signal, signaling also phosphorylates argonaut 2 in serin 387, I believe, and that this phosphorylation increases the affinity between argonaut 2 and TNRC6, and I would suspect that uh, that further promotes the stability of the association. So we have a question from Wen Tang. Thank you for the interesting talk. How are AGO2 associated small RNAs generated in quiescent cells? Is <laughs> DICER or any enzyme in the PWE pathway involved? That is a fantastic question. I unfortunately do, do not know the answer to that, that question. So Laura is doing those experiments right now. So we don't even have clip yet to show a direct binding between argonaut and transposon RNAs or to identify the specific small RNAs that are bound to argonaut 2 in quiescence. So we do see small RNAs that we think could potentially bind to argonaut 2. We don't know <laughs> if they actually do. Um, but once we, we have that data, Laura is going to repeat those experiments in the context of dicernal cells and catalytic ego 2 mutants and see how that affects the abundance. We have a question from Joe Ziegelbauer. Have you done HA pull down assays of nuclear versus cytoplasmic ago 2 to look at associated proteins using mass spec? Uh, yes, we have. We have the first replica data in. And Laura just sent the next two replicates. Um, not surprisingly, we find almost no binding partners in the nucleus. In the first replicate, we have to see if those are even consistent. But we do seem to have modifications in the protein itself that are differential between the two proliferating and nuclear states. So we are exciting to see if that's reproducible, and if that makes any difference to this. Uh, so Joe this. also asks, why you think, why do you think others miss the strong nuclear localization of AGO2 in quiescent cells? I think the reason is that people haven't really looked, would be my answer. Uh, it's, uh, I think that for technical reasons, it has been, this protein has been mostly studied in vitro which is the reason why we decided to make the, to do the mouse. And although, as I've shown you, I guess I didn't show you, but I mentioned, there are ways to try and induce quiescence in vitro, but that's a very poor reflection of the quiescent cell state in vivo. So I, I just think that it's a difficulty. I think you need to work with mice to actually have seen such a drastic change. So we have a question from Ildar Ganetinov. Wonderful talk. Did you detect phasing of AGO2 loaded small RNAs, such as a tail to head arrangement, which could be an in indication of Dicer's involvement? Uh, hi, Ildar. That's a fantastic question. We've, we are now doing the clip to check which small RNAs are actually bound. So I don't know, but when we do have the data, maybe I can reach out to you and uh, get your thoughts on whether it seems like dicer dependent or not. Mm -hmm. We have a question from Peter Johnson. Have you tested if AGO2 undergoes nuclear translocation in senescent cells, such as during oncogene-induced senescence? Uh, 
We have done those experiments. Um, I don't think we have repeated them enough for me to be 100% confident on the answer. But my impression uh, from those assays is that we do not see nuclear accumulation in senescent cells. And based on the literature, I would say that that would fit with our hypothesis, because I believe that in senescent cells, you still have um, high PI3 kinase signaling. But, but again, we, we, we would have to repeat that to be sure. And we have a related question to Ildars. Hello, Joanna. Thanks for the very interesting talk. Did you check the RNA cargos carried by AGO2 in quiescent cells? And is there any RNA sequence preference for these AGO2, AGO2 proteins? These are all fantastic questions. I would say that for a lot of questions that you guys are asking are questions that we ourselves are trying to address in the lab. So I don't have an answer for you. Um, yeah, we are doing these experiments. We are trying to see what, what, what are the small RNAs that are bound and uh, are they really similar to other sRNAs that have been characterized in other species or is anything different? Is it dicer dependent or not? We don't know yet. We have a question from um, Elizabeth Maniataki. I may have actually missed this, but I was wondering what happens to young transposons when AGO2 moves to the cytoplasm in dividing cells. Um, I think that's a great question. I, so transposons are one of those elements in the genome that can be repressed by multiple pathways. And to the as far as we understand, in the context of proliferating cells, they are repressed through a mechanism that's independent of Argonaut 2. And so it's really there's really no requirement. You can delete Argonaut 2 and transposons don't really um, care because there are methylation and histone modifications that repress it without needing this specific mechanism. As far as we can tell, this is dependence of Argonaut 2 occurs in the context of the soma, of quiescent cells, sorry. So we have one last question, which is a technical question. Uh, Hadi Najafi wonders if you have any recommendation for an efficient anti-AGO2 antibody for Western blot or IP. This is a little bit of a difficult question for me to answer. I've had this question many times. I would say that the reason why we made the mouse is because we were not sure how much we could trust antibodies, in, specifically looking in vivo, where we would not be able to have a knockout to confirm the specificity. Um, so I, I, I would, if you're working with, if you're interested in mice, I would recommend you to go to the molecular cell paper from Marcus Hafner lab. And there they did the number of characterizations in cell lines and you have knockout um, tissues, uh, cells, et cetera, so that um, you, know, you can more or less control for the specificity. But in vivo, I would not know another one except with a tagged uh, animal. And we have, before we close, we have one final comment from Anna Kuchewski, who notes that she recently published nuclear AGO2 in human glioma proliferative cells. Okay, I, I will look at the paper, Anna. Thank you for pointing out. Uh, one thing that I want to say is that we do see, I guess it, when we look at quiescent cells, there is such a striking, uh, I mean, 90% of Argonaut is in the nucleus, right? And that's really something that called our attention. But I don't think, and even though I do tell this story a little bit uh, like it's a black and white picture, everything is in the nucleus in quiescent cells and everything is in the cytoplasm in proliferating cells. That's not actually the case. And indeed, if you look, <laughs> preprint, or if you remember the uh, images that I've shown you before, in the proliferating cells, 40% uh, is still in the nucleus, right? It's just that it's very diluted because the nucleus is so big. So it's really the most concentration of Argonaut is in the cytoplasm. So I think there will be 
um, shades in uh, the localization of Argonaut in different contexts, but the most striking differences that we found has been between quiescence and proliferating. But I, I think you will find other uh, contexts in which we have different amounts of protein. So, um, it's time to stop. And I just want to thank both speakers and all the attendees for um, the wonderful attendance and the wonderful talks. So, thank you. Thank you, Sandy, for moderating. <laughs>